As you can see, St George Hospital is in Sydney, Australia. Check out the blue sky, <laughs> the gum trees, and of course the koala up the lamppost. So to set the scene for our case study, St George is a 627 bed major teaching hospital of the University of New South Wales and is a tertiary referral hospital. It offers a range of specialist inpatient and community services and Calvary Hospital, which is where I work, is a 40 bed inpatient palliative care unit and a 40 bed aged care and rehabilitation unit and Calvary is alongside St George. So responding effectively and compassionately to the many and varied needs of patients and families in the setting of life-threatening and life-limiting illness can be challenging for health professionals. There is increasing evidence of patient dissatisfaction with care and of health professionals struggling to cope with heavy workloads, long hours, and financial restraints within the health system, which I'm sure many of you here today can relate to. Indeed, a recent survey of 43,000 doctors and 7,000 medical students by a leading Australian mental health group, Beyond Blue, and this report was uh, released two weeks ago and made headlines in the Daily News, found that doctors report substantially higher rates of psychological distress and attempted suicide compared to both the Australian population and other Australian professionals. In particular, levels of psychological distress in doctors and medical students aged 30 years and below were significantly higher than individuals aged 30 and younger in the general population. In this survey, 21% had been diagnosed or treated for depression in the previous 12 months. One quarter had thoughts of suicide. Reported levels of burnout were high against the three domains of emotional exhaustion, cynicism, and low professional efficacy. Younger and female doctors had higher rates of burnout than preclinical and clinical medical students, suggesting that the transition from study to working may be a particularly difficult time for newly trained doctors. Of significance, the most common source of work stress related to the need to balance work with personal commitments and responsibilities. This was followed by too much work to do, responsibility at work, long work hours, and the fear of making mistakes. There has also been some criticism of the medical education system. One author, Shapiro, has written that it overemphasizes logico-scientific thinking and problem solving. It neglects medicine as a moral enterprise. It devalues personal identity, discounts personal experience, disqualifies the narrative, overemphasizes control, and encourages distance between medical students and patients. So, it was against this background that my colleague, Professor John Kersley, who is a radiation oncologist, and Dr. Chris Sanderson, a palliative care consultant at Calvary and myself, sought to identify ways to engage, support, and rehumanize medical students and junior doctors. Firstly, the whole person care group was formed. And this is based on a group that was established at McGill University in Canada. And this is an affiliation of clinicians and researchers from St George and Calvary who have a particular interest and commitment to the values and philosophies that underpin the practice of holistic care. It aims to highlight the many facets of whole person care by promoting better care of patients and self-care of health professionals, especially those engaged with patients who have life-limiting illness. These whole person care symposiums, which were held in 2010, 2012, and we have one next year, attracted over 200 healthcare professionals. And they were not in the usual conference format. The topics that we discussed were of hope, dignity, suffering, uncertainty, self-compassion, and self-care, all of which spoke to those aspects of care in the setting of life-threatening illness that clinicians struggle to embrace and balance in an increasingly technological environment, an environment that has the potential to dehumanise and isolate, isolate both patients and clinician. A significant component of these, these symposiums were panels where senior health professionals spoke of their own engagement and struggle with these topics. And this was particularly relevant to junior doctors who saw that their consultants were indeed human and did not always have the answers. 
We then took a component of these symposiums to 50 junior medical officers and surgical trainees at St George in their half-day education session that we called The Case That Keeps Me Awake. We invited the participants to identify and write down a clinical case that they remembered, what happened, what they felt and what they did. Everyone in their clinical career can readily identify such cases. With permission, these cases were read out and discussed. I should say that they were instructed not to write about the patient's clinical aspects. We did not want to know about their biochemistry or their surgical procedure, but rather what aspect affected them the most. And these were nearly always ethical and psychosocial components of patient care. We then offered an opportunity to debrief and to consider alternative approaches to these cases. We made the decision to seek ethics approval to run the workshop. We sent participants an information sheet about what was expected of them and what would happen in the workshops. We obtained signed consent. The facilitator was a very well-known psychotherapist and author, very experienced in running groups. However, by afternoon tea time, we had lost half of the participants, ostensibly being called back to the ward on their pages, even though pages had to be turned off. Some of the doctors reacted strongly to being what they perceived as assessed in front of their peers. Some thought the language of the facilitator was psychobabble and not scientific. And of concern, some felt that they had been coerced into attending and that there was a hidden agenda, despite us being very open in the information sheet. So I think it's really important to reflect on this initial foray and the lessons that we learned. So firstly is the importance of building trust in the group, the challenges of pulling junior doctors off the ward, even though this was meant to be protected education time. Many felt drawn back to their busy workloads, answering their pages to their consultants. Third, the risks inherent in forcing people to attend and finally, the difficulty in achieving much worthwhile using a large group format. So the question was asked, do we need to catch them earlier? Is there a window of opportunity before the pressures of hospital routine? This was the focus of annual elective workshops and healing run by Professor Kersley for medical students in their print term. So this is the pre-intern stage of their undergraduate curriculum. So the aims of the workshop were to facilitate learning about healing and about personhood, to encourage self-reflection, to introduce the concept of the use of the therapeutic self, to assist students to, undercover, to uncover their own skills. It was based on the concept of transformative learning, and these workshops used art, music, sculpture, and personal reflection to focus on the aspects that drew them to medicine in the first place, their goals, their aspirations, and their dreams. One of the participants in the workshop commented, with the course I shifted my focus in medicine from science to human beings. I feel worthwhile of being a doctor who alleviates suffering rather than treating the disease. The change may seem tiny, but it will be able to sustain me through. So in summary, our aim in fostering these programs have been to transform medical students into physician healers, to allow doctors to rediscover their humanity and to regain their time-honoured role as healers. We have aimed for a bottom-up as well as a top-down approach, targeting clinical leaders and future leaders. We want to promote a focus not just on patient or person-centred care, but on relationship-centred care. And we aim to be open to all health professionals. Professor John... <laughs> The story hasn't ended yet. Um, Professor John Kersley came along to one of our public Compassion and Presence seminars, and he, he said at the time, he said, um, you've got the methods. I've been searching for these everywhere, and um, I haven't been able to find them elsewhere. So since then, he um, has had a number of his colleagues, including Liz, come to our public seminar, and both Liz and John are now championing this training within the St George Hospital setting. So the methods that we're using uh, are based on the Buddhist tradition and most specifically on Sogyal Rinpoche's book, The Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. And although they're based on Buddhism, 
they're using very universal principles. So you don't have to become a Buddhist and you don't have to meditate. The methods of mindfulness, meditation and compassion can in develop the innate ability within all of us to be both present and compassionate. Anyone can learn these skills and develop compassion, resilience, and the ability to respond more effectively to others' needs. This training's been developed by our international team, comprising Christine Longacre, Rosmond Oliver, and Kirsten DeLeo, each of whom have been drawing on over 20 years of experience in training health and social uh, professionals. And in fact, Rosman Oliver and Margaret Tatum are running this workshop as part of this conference this weekend. And to date, this training's been given in nine countries. And in Australia, Wendy Wright and myself have been running it for three years. The methods have been around for centuries, but it's only now that neuroscientific research is beginning to explain why they are so powerful and transformative. Feedback and self-reports of the participants, as well as the research on empathy, compassion, and mindfulness, validate that these methods have the potential to build greater resilience and renewal for those who are working to alleviate suffering. It's clear that our innate compassion can actually be cultivated and that there are methods that can help us, whatever our experience. Whilst the elements of our training we, that we give are similar, we adapt them to specific needs of the group to be trained. In this instance, this recent training was given to pre-intern doctors at St George Hospital. We limited the size of the group to 24, and coincidentally, the average age of the participants was 24. Um, but given their youth, we felt we needed a, a very small group, and we work um, to develop um, a real sense of trust so that they can work at very deep levels, uh, which facilitates transformative learning happening within a shorter time as two days. One of the key features of the training is a strong emphasis on practical ways of integration and communication, which means that participants can take the learning back into their challenging daily work without elaborate training. And we, we try to give them methods that they don't have to actually spend hours meditating or doing something extra than what they're actually doing, but we train them to use these skills whilst they're working as much as possible. And it's important to remind ourselves of the depth of the challenges health or social care professionals face. Before receiving the training, this group of pre-intern doctors in Sydney revealed that in the midst of an incredibly demanding work environment, they felt a fear of appearing vulnerable and the need to bury their own emotions a fear of losing their humanity. One said, I've been disturbed by the emotional and empathic disconnect that I witness from other health professionals, as well as within myself when treating patients. Another said, I'm rather anxious about internship this year. I feel I am ill-prepared. My interest in medicine is slowly burning out. And I feel an encroaching cynicism within myself and amongst my peers and would relish the opportunity to rekindle my connection to the very concepts, compassion and care. After the training, they stated, I believe this training will have a profound impact on the care relationship and recovery of patients. And this training helped me to clarify my purpose and motivation behind the direction I have taken. It will help me incorporate daily practical techniques to cultivate compassionate approaches that help both myself and my patients. Another said, to have a seminar that combines the two elements of mindfulness and being present into easy to learn and practical skills is life changing. And this was a good experience for self evaluation and planning on how to be a more intentional and compassionate doctor not only to patients and other people in our lives, but also to ourselves. So you can see that the emphasis on the training is actually about self-care, of, of learning to be compassionate and caring for ourselves. By helping us to stay connected with and develop our innate compassion and training builds resilience, authenticity and confidence, creating not only better outcomes for care professionals personally as well as patients and clients, but in addition, more nourishing and supportive workplaces and organisations. 
Workplace cultures are notoriously difficult to change, and changing culture needs to be tackled on many levels. Conferences such as this and the whole person conferences that Professor Kearsley um, and Liz organise, they help to raise awareness and acceptance of the value of training in compassion. The next step would be to have the development of these skills become a recognised part of both university and continuing education and for it to be supported by managers and decision makers. While this has been a study with pre-intern doctors, this training has been applied in other hospitals to a variety of staff, including nurses, managers, allied health and social staff at all levels of the organisation. And we're working with another hospital um, in Australia where we're working across departments and um, hierarchically as well, which is proving to also to be successful. Witnessing the transformation that occurs amongst participants over the course of two days is a great privilege, and we will be continuing to work with St George Hospital. I thank Liz and John for giving Wendy and I the opportunity to participate in their vision of transforming St George into a more compassionate hospital, and may this training spread to all hospitals.